All right, so today's webinar is going to be presented by Carly Gerla from the Bureau of Reclamation. She's going to be giving us an overview of the Colorado River Basin Water Supply and Demand Study. Um, if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat. And we'll keep an eye on that and let, let Carly know. Um, and then you'll have time at the end to ask questions as well. So I want to thank Carly for uh, making the time to be with us today and give us this presentation. And thank you all for making the time to participate. All right, Carly, I'm going to hand it over to you. OK, thanks, Amy. And thanks, everyone, for your time and attention today. I have about, oh, I'd say 25 to 30 minute presentation. And then I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. The presentation is um, structured as described here. I'll spend a little bit of time talking uh, very broad terms, giving an overview of the study, then dive into the supply and demand scenarios that we quantified um, as part of the study to help us understand what the water supply and demand imbalance on the Colorado River Basin might be over the next 50 years. Then I'll talk about the options and strategies that we explored to resolve those imbalances. I'll talk a little bit about the system reliability analysis that we performed and um, some of the highlights of those results, and then spend some time talking about where we go from here in our next steps effort. Uh, the map that you see here is the map of our study area. And we define the study area to be the hydrologic boundaries of the Colorado River Basin, and then those adjacent areas that receive Colorado River water. And those adjacent areas are in the red hatched um, areas. And these are particularly important because we do export so much water that is originated and generated within the hydrologic boundaries of the basin to areas outside of the basin. About 25% or so is exported out to the Colorado Front Range and other areas in the upper basin. And then in the lower basin, it's about double that, or 50%. So these areas are pretty important, especially when you're thinking about um, future demand and how other supplies may blend in with the Colorado River supply. The study was conducted through the Water Smart program. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the Basin Study program is a program underneath that broader umbrella program. Um, it, it had two objectives, which was that the at the time we started this study, which is January and January of 2010. Um, basin studies had the, these similar objectives. Um, now basin studies are really focused more on the second objective, which is looking at options and strategies for resolving imbalances. But so part of our basin study was twofold. It was identifying those imbalances, looking at what impact those imbalances have on the reliability of the system to meet the needs of the resources over the next 50 years, and then looking at options and strategies to resolve those imbalances and improve that reliability. This was a three-year study. It was conducted by rep both Reclamation's Upper Colorado and Lower Colorado region in collaboration with agencies representing the seven basin states, and those were our cost share partners. And um, those partners are listed there on that table. The cost share was roughly about 50-50. Um, I think by the very end of the study, we were maybe 55 reclamation, 45 percent basin states, but we were close. And it was a combination of both in-kind services and also cash contribution. We used the cash contribution to hire a consultant to help us on the study. Um, and those consultants were, the lead consultant was CH2M Hill. Um, and then Black and Beach was a sub con subcontractor to CH2M Hill. And then we also hired on the RAND Corporation about two years into the study to really help us out with the system reliability analysis phase of the study. And I don't need to tell you all, but um, I often make this point when we're giving this presentation to the public that this is not a decisional document. It's a planning study. It was meant to be very broad and establish a technical foundation for future discussions. Um, there were no decisions or hard and fast recommendations about future actions that came out of this study. 
So we were we do, we arranged the study into four different phases to accomplish those uh, those two objectives. In phase one, we call it our water supply assessment. We're projecting what supply might look like over the entire basin over the next 50 years. In phase two, we're doing the same thing, but for water demand. Uh, the two boxes in between phase one and phase two represent the scenario planning approach that we undertook in the study to give us a range of what those future supply and demand scenarios might look like. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In phase three, we bring those projections of supply and demand together and we see how does the system respond to those different future conditions. At the core of this is um, the utilization of our Colorado River Simulation System, which is a riverware based uh, river reservoir operations model um, that simulates uh, the operation of the entire system. And we understand there uh, how we're vulnerable for the different resources we operate for. In phase four, we use that information to help us generate options and strategies um, to deal with those vulnerabilities. And then we look to see how effective uh, those options and strategies are. The final study report is really a compilation of multiple technical documents. So there's seven technical reports, A through G, and those are going to cover um, really every major piece of the study. Um, it's about 1,500 pages or so for all seven of those technical documents. So we did a couple um, shortened roll-up versions for folks who couldn't quite take the time to read that much. So there's a 100-page study report. And what's a little bit unique about the study report is this is where we've included our discussion on next steps and where we um, should go from here. And then in our executive summary, that's a you know, much shorter version of the study report. All of, the, um, all of these reports are avail available for download on our website. Um, I will say that the approach that we took to generate these reports over the three years that we were conducting the study was to issue interim reports um, and give public webinars on the interim products, take comments um, along the way, uh, reach out to various stakeholders, incorporate their input and thoughts into these technical documents. So we feel pretty confident that we've um, incorporated a lot of um, public comment as well as our other stakeholders' involvement in these reports um, along the way. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of shift gears into really um, what the, the approach of the study and the findings of the study. Um, the first thing is that we did undertake a scenario planning approach. This was really the, the foundational approach that drove the whole study. It's recognizing that the way the Colorado River system in terms of supply and demand is going to unfold over the next 50 years is um, highly uncertain. There's an infinite number of futures that can exist. Um, so we set out to come up with a manageable number of those plausible futures that would span the range of that cone of uncertainty, which is that figure you see there. We know where we are now um, as we move throughout time over the next 50 years. We have decisions and disruptive events that throw us off the trajectory we thought we were on. Our aim was to quantify scenarios that would give us a broad range of that cone um, over the next 50 years. So for water supply, we had four different scenarios. Um, the first one is a pretty narrow view of that cone. It's called observed resampled. And the idea here is that you say, what if the future supply is really the same as what we've seen historically? So we have a 100-year historical record for natural flow on the basin. So we resample this. We just repeat it 105 different times, which is what the length of it is, to get a future that is really statistically exactly the same as what we've seen historically. OK, so not a very a uh, wide cone you get by looking at that. So we added in um, what we called the paleo resampled. So it's the same exact concept, 
except now we're resampling a much longer record. We're using our paleo or tree ring reconstructed streamflow record that dates back 1,200 years. By doing this, we can see um, longer wet spells and longer droughts than we've seen in our historical record, which kind of expands that cone yet a little more. To add to that, we included um, a technique called paleo conditioned. This is blending really our historic record and that paleo record using the strengths of both, the strengths of both rather, um, to give us yet even different sequences that stress the system even more. And these three supply scenarios right here are things that we have used previously in our planning, so prior to taking on the basin study. Um, they've been featured in uh, EISs, so, well, I guess just one EIS, our 2007 Interim Guidelines EIS. So this was really nothing new um, for this study. It's just we wanted to include these um, two because they did represent uh, plausible futures. What was really new that we did for this study was to utilize um, projections from global climate models. Um, so we really started an effort um, prior to when the study started to take projections from GCMs. So this is the CMIP-3 projections the, where the downscaled bias corrected precipitation and temperature was hosted on the Santa Clara University Reclamation Lawrence Livermore National Lab website. We took that information, ran it through the VIC hydrologic model to get stream flow. Um, then kind of after we had started that, then um, Reclamation TSC also started their project where they were kind of doing the same thing. And so those efforts um, merged at the right time and we were kind of able to utilize strength from both efforts, which ultimately was what we used. Um, for this projection in the study. And one last thing I'll say about this, because this will help to understand the results a little bit later, is that each one of these supply scenarios have multiple different sequences that comprise a scenario. So for the climate change or the downscale GCM projected scenario, we did utilize every one of the 112 GCM projections. So we have 112 sequences that make up this one supply scenario. And um, that's how we're able to look at you know, a distribution and compute likelihoods and probabilities um, with, with these types of results. OK, so we'll just look at one view um, of some of the water supply scenario results. We have a, I think, 300-page or so document that talks about the results of these water supply scenarios. It's going to take you through precipitation and temperature and other hydrologic parameters, look at um, droughts and wet spells and all those different features of these hydrologic scenarios um, if you're interested in that type of information. But what we normally show is we're looking at um, what our future long-term average natural flow at Lee's Ferry might look like under these different scenarios. So I'm sure you all are, know the significance of Lee's Ferry on the Colorado River Basin. So that's um, a point in the upper basin where about 90% or so of the flow in the basin kind of culminates to. So if you measure natural flow at that point, you're getting a pretty good indication of what the flow in the entire basin is. Um, natural flow, we always use this to, when we're looking at future hydrology and what we use to drive our simulation model. So this is what the flow would have been absent any impacts by humans. So there's no depletions included in here. There's no reservoir regulation. That happens when you feed that into the model. So we're looking at natural flow, leaf berry, um, box plots of the long-term average, if you look at the observed in the blue on the left, you're seeing that um, the triangle, which is the median, is right about at 15 million acre feet. That is what our historical average is on this basin. So it makes sense that um, we would statistically be seeing the same thing of what our 100-year record is. 
if you look all the way to the right and you look at the climate change projections, you notice two things. Um, one, that that box has gotten wider. So we're looking at a larger variability in terms of the 25th and 75th percentile of where that future projection could be, but you're also looking at the lower median is indicated by that lower triangle. And it's about at 13.6 million acre feet. Um, it, it, on the median, it's a 9% decline in what our historical average has been, um, but by the range of that box plot, you know that that um, can be much higher or lower. Uh, the line that just popped up here is what our recent 20-year average has been on this basin. Uh, it's about 13.5 million acre feet. So that kind of gives you an indication of what um, an average, a long-term average of 13.6 million acre feet might feel like. It really feels like what we've been experiencing um, on this basin over the last 20 years, which a good portion of that 20 years has been um, really one of the worst droughts we've seen even by the paleo standards. So um, it doesn't feel very nice <laughs> in terms of uh, reservoir elevations and other resource impacts. Okay, now shifting gears to water demand scenarios. We have six of them. We put them together through multi-stakeholder teams that really started thinking about this from a very foundational level of what are the types of things that drive future demand on the basin? How important are those things? How uncertain are those things? OK, we know which ones are really important. We know which ones are really uncertain. Let's weave those together and make storylines, assuming that what if they have very divergent, different trajectories? Um, all that was done. They came up with six storylines. First one, current projected. This is kind of your middle of the road, business as usual type thing medium growth patterns, um, kind of what a lot of the water agencies really already had on the books in terms of what they were planning for. That's bracketed by a slow growth and a rapid growth that are really looking at differences in population growth rates and then also the rate at which we adopt technology for water efficiency. And then we have um, an, an enhanced environment scenario with two different branches there moderate or rapid population. And this is really thinking about um, social values, expanded environmental awareness, and how that plays into water efficiency rates. So we, we drafted those storylines, and then we went about quantifying those storylines, which gave us our quantified demand scenarios. And so this figure shows you how we went about doing that. So there, on, on, in the blue, squares are those parameters that I talked about that those stakeholder teams, you know, identified these things. And those feed into different sectors of demand, and those are the green boxes. So you have ag and m and and energy and um, et cetera. If you quantify those parameters and you get all of those different sectors of demand and you add those up, you get what your study area demand is. So remember the hydrologic boundaries of the basin plus those adjacent areas. But to really understand the impact to the Colorado River Basin, you have to move that study area demand to Colorado River demand, which means you have to start making some assumptions about what other supplies are going to provide. And we did that um, working very closely with each of the basin states. Each of the states that do export water have, you know, have a very different assumption and view about that, how that may play out um, over time, but we needed to get there to understand what the impact of the Colorado River might look like. Um, just one last thing I'll say about the approach to quantifying the demand. Uh, we did this for each state at what we called a planning area level. And so for each planning area, we went about quantifying all of those different parameters. And I'm just showing you for Colorado and Arizona, um, what these planning areas were like, so you can kind of get an idea um, of, of the size and what level of detail we went into. Okay, and so as far as the results go, at a basin-wide level, um, we're seeing demand that's going to range from about um, over 16 million acre feet to just above 
15 million acre feet by 2060 on the basin. If you add in the treaty delivery to Mexico and then other losses such as reservoir EVAP, you know, that grows about to 18 to 20 million acre feet. It's really driven by population. We have a pretty wide range in terms of our population. We're going from adding about 9 million people to doubling our population by 2060, so almost up to 80 million people that are using Colorado River water. Uh, another thing we saw across the scenarios is that we are getting more efficient. Even in slow growth scenarios with a weak economy, we do still see efficiency gains, but it's just not enough to um, uh, match that growth in population. And then on a basin-wide level in terms of agriculture, we do see a decrease in acreage, not by a lot, but it's still a decrease across all of those scenarios, really um, being driven by two things, urban sprawl onto irrigated land, so you lose acreage that way, um, but also becoming more efficient in the way um, in our agricultural practices and being able to produce the same or more food or crops using less land. So that was another finding. Um, so then we bring supply and demand together, and I'm sure many of you, many of you have probably seen this figure in one form or another. This is probably the most famous figure from the basin study. Um, we bring supply and demand together, and we can kind of fill out the next 50 years uh, of this plot. So this plot is showing you for a million acre feet on the um, y-axis, years on the x-axis going from about 1919 to 2060. Um, it's taking what our historical supply and our historical use have been at a 10-year running average and then adding on the results of all of those scenario quantifications in the shaded area. Um, you know, two things jump out is that um, use is steadily on the rise as is demand. We are currently at an imbalance a 10 year running, um, at a 10-year running average. We have clearly, our use has surpassed our supply. It's con projected to continue to do so in the future. Because of the amount of reservoir storage that we have on the system, four times the average annual flow, we've been able to really get away with that historically. We're concerned about how prolonged and how deep some of these imbalances might get over the future. If you compare the two midpoints of those supply and demand projections, you're looking at a 3.2 million acre foot imbalance. And that really only tells you so much. I mean, what's really important is how this is actually being realized on the ground. How are the resources responding to that? Um, what are some of the regional differences in these imbalances? And how does that m mesh up with what those resource needs are? And so we got at some of that in, in a limited way, um, but it, it was a good first step, and it was through our system reliability analysis. Uh, like I said, kind of at the heart of this is the use of our Colorado River simulation system. Um, and the idea here was to simulate how the system was performing over the next 50 years for all of those different scenarios without any type of options and strategies in place and then do it again with the options and strategies in place um, to see how uh, different metrics or vulnerabilities improve. So we have a handful of metrics. They're represented by all those colored dots throughout the basin for six different resource categories. Um, the resource categories are listed here at the bottom. I won't read them all off to you again. Uh, and Definitely the ability to measure the impact to some of these resources were, was very, very highly limited um, in the ability of the model that we were using to do these simulations. So the model operates at a monthly time step, for example. It's very uh, challenging to look at the impacts to ecological resources, for example, when you're dealing um, with a monthly time step. And of course, there's you know also um, <laughs> political discussions that kind of influence how these resources were um, uh, analyzed. So for example, um, uh, one critical part of the Colorado River Compact, the, the document that's dividing up the share of the river between the upper and the lower basin, uh, 
um, talks about a uh, obligation to not deplete the river below a certain amount in the upper basin providing water to the lower basin. But it has not been worked out quite yet what happens when that condition has been met. So we could only model so much what happens when that condition um, it is simulated without the logic to tell the model what to do in terms of shortages throughout the upper basin. And so our ability to model some impacts are also compromised by those types of things. So sorry, probably went into a little too much detail there, but just wanted to give you an idea of the type of limitations we were running up against in doing this analysis. Um, so then, uh, as we were performing the analysis, at least for the baseline, which is all the, the future conditions with no options and strategies in place, um, we started uh, collecting ideas really from the public about different options and strategies to resolve these imbalances. We got about 160 ideas. We divided them up into these four basic categories. Um, really we set out to consider and reflect all of the ideas that were received, regardless of how contentious they may be. But when we move forward to actually build portfolios and look to see how these things are going to improve and balances, we really more focused on those types of things that would result in new water. So either increased supply, augmentation type options, or reduced demand, the conservation type options. We did look at one, modify operations, so a banking, water banking type option. Those are highly complex um, and took a lot of effort to include this in the study, but we worked um, very closely with a consortium of environmental organizations that thought it was pretty important to kind of expand the range a little bit in terms of not just looking at um, augmentation and conservation options. So we. Um, went through a process where we took um, you know, 40 or so of the options that we were going to consider. We put them through an appraisal level type study where we looked at a whole set of criteria, cost, timing, yield, certainty of that yield, environmental permitting requirements, all of these things, um, rated them A through D, A being good, D through being bad. Um, meaning if you were thinking about the criterion timing, A would be it could come on, could come on really quick, D would be you know, it, it's going to take decades to get this on board. We used that set of criteria. We actually implemented it in a tool. It was a portfolio development tool, and different stakeholders could, um, get, based on their preferences, so for example, environmental community, their preferences were towards um, solutions that had low environmental impacts, low energy needs. They could select that criteria and then what they would get was the options that fit that and we, they could use that to put together a portfolio. So that's how we developed these portfolios. Um, really exciting names, A through D. They did have different names at one point, <laughs> but we had to back off and just ended up with A through D. Um, B and C really represent two different strategies. B is high certainty, high technical feasibility. Um, it's sort of the water manager strategy, whereas C is really looking at things with low environmental risk, long-term flexibility, uh, low energy needs. It's more of an environmental strategy. And then A and D um, bracket those in different ways, um, as you can see by the diagram here. This is just to, I won't spend a lot of time here, but it's just to give you a flavor of the different types of options that are sitting inside these portfolios. Um, so you have your broad categories there going down on the very left column, and then um, different representative, more detailed options that fit in that category. And then an X is if it's included in the portfolio, and no X is it's not in that portfolio. You can see portfolio A includes everything. B is very selective, only the handful of things that fit in both B and C. Um, in B, for example, you notice right away B has importation into the Colorado Front Range from either the Missouri or the Mississippi River. That's a very, it's technically feasible and it has a high certainty in that you build it, the water will be there. 
but it also has very high energy needs, very high environmental permitting requirements, um, and a very large footprint, which is why it didn't make the cut into Portfolio C. So that's just an example of how those preferences play out. Um, another example would be if you look at watershed management dust control options. Um, that is very environmentally easy to implement, but it's not very certain in, t in terms of what type, what amount of water it might yield. So it's not in B, but it's in C. Okay, so just a, <clears throat> excuse me, a flavor of what the results look like. I'm only going to show you results from the water deliveries resource category. Uh, there's six different categories. All of the results are laid out in technical report G. That's, I don't know, like 300 pages or something. So there's a lot more information. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on the water deliveries category. Here are four kind of key metrics for the upper basin and lower basin in terms of water deliveries. That Lee Ferry deficit, that's kind of what I was speaking to earlier. That speaks to the upper basin's obligation to not deplete uh, the flow at Lee Ferry below a certain amount. When that happens, curtailment has to occur in the upper basin. So they're very concerned um, about that happening. And the lower basin, Lake Mead below 1,000, is critical elevation. Southern Nevada Water Authority can't currently deliver water to the Las Vegas Valley below that level. There's also widespread shortages throughout the lower basin at that point. Um, and then another is a critical threshold. This lower basin exceeding a million acre feet shortage over a two-year window is another critical threshold for the lower basin. So you can see we're getting some pretty high levels of vulnerability under our baseline scenarios. So again, we're looking at all of those different futures kind of collapse, and then we look at what percent of those futures result in a vulnerability occurring. So we actually have 23,000 different futures if you multiply all those different scenarios together. And if you look at lower basin shortage over the long term, 2040 to 2060, you're seeing an 80% of those 23,000 futures, the lower basin is getting a shortage that exceeds a million acre feet over any two years. So that's a high level of vulnerability. Um, for, uh, on the other side of the coin, leaf area deficit, 23,000 futures, only 16% of them result in a leaf area deficit. And that's mostly coming from pretty extreme climate change scenarios. OK, so then you put on the results of portfolios A through D and see how those levels of vulnerabilities change. Um, two things kind of jump out here. One is that you don't really see a real measurable difference in terms of the port in terms of the vulnerability reduction across portfolios. So they all seem to do about the same in terms of how they reduce vulnerability. And that's kind of was good news to us. To us, that meant we demonstrated four different approaches that were very different in nature that would result in a about the same level of reduction in terms of vulnerability. So we believe all the portfolios to be successful. Another thing that jumps out, and you can really see it in terms of the lower basin shortage, is you almost have a, um, you know, a, a bell-shaped uh, reduction in the vulnerability. So you reduce it pretty well in the beginning, but then it spikes back up, and that midterm drops back down the long term. And that's really speaking to the timing that your options can come online. So in the near term, there's a bunch of things you can do, conservation, reuse, transfers, that's going to drop your vulnerability. In the long term, those longer options like desalination, um, uh, you know, brackish water, uh, also groundwater, um, desal, ocean, sorry, imports from other river basins, those other things start to come online. But in the mid middle term, you're you're stuck in your planning and implementation phase, and you're not really seeing a big benefit in, time, in terms of reducing vulnerability. So that was an important finding um, in the study. So just my last slide here on results. Um, there's what that figure previously isn't showing you is the trade-offs across all of those different portfolios. So you're not seeing at what cost. Um, 
to get a certain level of effectiveness throughout those portfolios. Um, so we we went down a road to try to get at that, um, and this figure is going to kind of take you through those results. And we focused on two really key water delivery vulnerabilities. Upper basin, there's your leave ferry deficit again, and then in the right most column, the key lower basin vulnerability is need going below 1,000. And you can see what your baseline level of vulnerability is there in the dotted line. And then you have the, your four portfolios, what the distribution of cost is amongst those portfolios. And then that um, sorry, vertical line is right at the median, what that cost is. And then the, the distance down, because there on the y-axis is your level of vulnerability, the distance down those portfolios are from the baseline is really the level of vulnerability that you've reduced or how resilient you've made yourself. So if we're combining all of those different water supply scenarios together, we're not seeing a real measurable difference in terms of um, resilience and cost. If you start to pull out some of the more extreme low stream flow conditions from those supply scenarios, so we're probably focused on a handful of maybe the 75th percentile or so climate change projections you start to see some um, differences in also your baseline vulnerability. You're obviously more vulnerable under lower stream flow conditions, but you start to see trade-offs in terms of how the portfolios are playing out. Now, pull out um, the most extreme conditions from the supply scenarios, and you really start to see some spread. So your baseline vulnerability has jumped up tremendously. Uh, for Lake Mead, it's, it's 71%. But now you can really start to see how much it's going to cost you to get to a certain level of resilience or decrease in vulnerability. Um, you can start to see the trade-offs in the different portfolios. So if you look at the Lee Ferry deficit between portfolio B and C, um, and C, you're dropping your vulnerability in the upper basin to below 10%, almost 5% and it's costing you $5 billion a year in 2060 at 2012 cost, whereas in Portfolio B, um, it's costing you a $1 billion more a year for not the same level of reduction. So that's interesting. Um, and then we also look at some different trade-offs and you know, what the energy needs might be, the impacts of the environment, uh, those types of things from these different portfolios. And the study really leaves it at that. Um, it looks at these trade-offs, um, helps people to understand. It's a conversation starter, and it's really um, where we go to for our next steps activities. So broad take-home points from the study. We're vulnerable if we do nothing. We demonstrate that across all of the different resource categories we look at. If we do something, we greatly reduce that vulnerability. So think back to that figure that has you know, all of the portfolios um, next to each other, and we're seeing about the same level of reduction in vulnerability to all, for all of those portfolios. Um, but, and we, we are more resilient to adverse conditions. Um, there's a whole other part of the study where we actually looked at what type of hydrologies and climatic features were driving our vulnerability, and then how much more resilient are we to those same types of factors um, with these portfolios in place. So I didn't show you the results of that, but we do become more resilient to those types of conditions. But we do have some vulnerability all the time. We're never going to completely buffer ourselves from some of the most extreme um, climate conditions that are projected from the GCM. In the near term, Things like conservation, transfers, reuse are the co most cost-effective ways to reduce that vulnerability. That's where our next steps focus It really is. I'll talk about that in a minute. And in the longer term, you really have to have a discussion about trade-off. Um, what does it take to get to an acceptable level of risk? What is that acceptable level of risk? What types of options are needed? What's the cost, the energy requirements, the implications to other resources, et cetera, et cetera. OK, quickly I'll talk about our next steps. Um, the study report really ends with talking about 10 different areas where we should move forward in. 
here are the 10 different areas. They're kind of all over the place. There are little something in here for everyone. This kind of speaks to how this was generated. It was done through a multi-stakeholder team, so everyone kind of had um, their ideas about where we should be focused. Um, so we said, great, let's move forward in all of them. Um, we devised a process to do so, which I'll show you in a minute. And in the end of May in San Diego, Assistant Secretary Castle and the Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner Connor attended this event to really launch this process. It was attended by um, really some of the leaders across the basin for the state, the conservation community, and also the tribes, um, really in a coordinated, cooperative effort to move forward from what this what the study was kind of is still referred to as a call to action. So this diagram shows you how this next step process is laid out. Um, those the blue bubbles here speak back to that list of 10 areas where we said we were going to move forward in. There are some activities that are very much going to be state-led, and there are some activities that are very much going to be reclamation-led. Um, I won't go through those in detail. I'll just wait for questions to see if you want to know about one of those in more detail. And then in the center, we have a multi-stakeholder effort going on where we have three different working groups really speaking to those near-term options. We also have one looking at healthy river flows for the environment and recreation. Um, each multi-stakeholder team is co-chaired by three different chairs representing um, either the federal government, the state, or a conservation recreation um, entity. And then we have a multi-stakeholder coordination team that's overseeing the work of those work groups. Um, the work groups are building off of some of the analysis that was done in the study with an eye towards um, water savings or eventual pilot project implementation of some type of option. They won't get there in phase one. So this is a phase one effort. It's multi-phase. We don't know how many phases it's going to be, but we're in phase one right now. It's anticipated to take about a year, um, and part of that phase one effort is going to be scoping what phase two is. And so this is the effort that's underway right now, building off of the study. And with that, I'll go ahead and just say thanks again for listening, and I guess pass it back to Amy. Thanks so much, Carly. Um, I really want to congratulate you and your colleagues and, and the many, many people who work together on producing this study. I think um, it really is a cutting edge study in terms of how you've incorporated some of the climate information and um, looking at the various scenarios, um, possible future scenarios for dealing with this very important issue. Um, so thank you. And congratulations. Um, I want to put it out to the to the group, to our audience today. Does anyone have any questions for Carly? Um, be sure to unmute yourself. Um, Amy, uh, this is Brett. Can you hear me? Question from uh, on the chat. I'm sorry. I um, I will look on the chat. Looks like there is a question from Brett. Bruce, Brett, you want to go ahead and ask that yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, you kind of answered it, Carly, but you, you talked a little bit about ecological flows in the uh, resiliency analysis or whatever you call it, reliability analysis. Yeah. Um, was, it, was it explicitly considered in your uh, demand uh, analysis as well. Um, you know, this group, this LCC group, is uh, trying to look at the impacts of climate change and and water management on landscape conservation. I'm just wondering if, in your demand scenarios, you actually attempted to quantify ecological flow needs and and how you went about that. Good question, Brett. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> good. Long good time. Your, good to hear your voice. Likewise. Um, yeah, this is a really good question, and it was one that we really struggled with for a while. Um, and I think you probably remember some of this, so you're probably interested in how it actually turned out. 
So we had these um, envir so the enhanced environment demand scenarios, which were really about um, enhancing environmental flows. But environmental flows are non-consumptive demands. So right. we were really struggling with how to set that scenario apart from the other scenarios when the, the way you go about quantifying a scenario is through consumptive demand. So we do, and you know, we really didn't find a good way to get through it. And there's some language in the demand assessment report that speaks to how we finally dealt with it, which I'm about to try to explain. But we recognize that our non-consumptive demands were really being handled through the system reliability metrics for the environment. So those metrics are, you know, talking about what certain flows you need at certain parts in the river to support environmental resources. And so that's the same thing as a non-consumptive demand. Right. And that's really all we could do for that environmental scenario was to talk about how non-consumptive demands are different and how non-consumptive demands are being measured through the system reliability metrics, but they're being measured for all of the demand scenarios, but they should perform better under the enhanced environment because in an enhanced environment, you've reduced your consumptive demand to put more water in the river, therefore making your non-consumptive perform better. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tough question. It is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thanks. It's and you know it it all fits together and the answer's there. It's just kind of depends on how you go about um, you know uh, structuring your study, I guess. Right. Can I, I ask a follow-on? Sure. Uh, th this is Andrew Houting with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I, I think that was an excellent question regarding environmental flows, and as, as at least in the desert LCC context, you know, move, moving forward, kind of in, in the next step context, and w w one of my major take homes of this effort was there's there, there's an important bright line separating lower basin and, and upper basin um, mm -hmm. activities in the environmental flow context, mm -hmm. with it being depressing if you're in the lower basin, as, as all my work has been, because we really don't have much in the way of developed flow targets for, for the benefit of the environment. Um, I'm wondering how much of the next steps as far as fleshing out environmental flow potential in the lower basin context, is, is that going to be site-based? Are, are, are we going to look at specific river systems, um, you know, tributaries? The Bill Williams obviously comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. Help, help walk through what you, what you see the near to midterm future looks like in, 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 in that context. Okay, sure. Yeah, so what the the environmental flows, re, environmental recreational flows group is up to right now, um, and they're in their very early stages, you know, they're still getting agreement on their scope of work, but I think they're close. And they do really have a diverse um, membership in terms of the work group. So there's state, federal, um, you know, environmental, recreational, tribal representation there. And so what that group is doing to start um, is developing uh, a, a really a methodology that consists of developing criteria that's informed by a set of guiding principles that's going to help them identify focused reaches. So they are going to get, I think they, they recognize they're not going to try to tackle the whole basin at once because of one of the reasons is what you you know mentioned is that the upper basin is very different in nature than the lower basin um, so they'll this diverse group will get together will you know um, agree upon a methodology to get them to focus reaches they're looking at about I think they've said they don't want to tackle any more than six focus reaches then for those focus reaches they're going to tackle two different questions one is, can we enhance our modeling of these reaches anymore so we can you know, better see what some of the impacts under different future scenarios are in these areas? 
and then also really do a catalog of all of the in different um, you know environmental stream based programs that are out there not necessarily limited to the Colorado and could those be applied at any of these focus areas um, so that's that's generally what their scope is and I given that you know they're just finally getting agreement on that scope I would expect it would be maybe a couple three more months before they have their focus reaches identified and, and is that going to be largely a consortium of, of state fed and other participants um, it, yes it is but it's got a pretty heavy involvement from the conservation or conservation community. So example, it's being co-led by the State of Colorado Reclamation and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Wigington for TNC? Uh, no, Taylor. Taylor oh. Hawes. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Sure. Thank you. Good questions. Does anyone else have a question? All right, I have a question, Carly. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the stakeholder engagement process in developing um, the um, portfolio of potential actions. Um, you know, we know that the the demand is most likely going up, and um, there's probably not more water coming. Um, and a lot of uncertainty with climate change. So I know that you know it's a very um, how we manage our water is a very touchy issue. And I'm I'm curious how the stakeholder process was was pulled together um, and sort of what that process looked like. Could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I definitely you hit the nail on the head, and that when you're faced with these you know, very daunting challenges, you see different preferences from different stakeholder groups on the best way to go about tackling these challenges. And so, um, you know, we knew that right away that that was going to occur. We put together kind of one of our approaches to getting other stakeholders involved in the study that, you know, was funded by reclamation in the states was we developed um, we kind of had a hierarchy of, um, in terms of level of review of study documents, there was a hierarchy in terms of who was involved on that level of review. So there was a what we called a project team, which was just reclamation in the states. And that team had kind of the ultimate veto power, I guess you would call it, on study documents that were going to be published. But sitting below that were subgroups that were multi-stakeholder um, that would, you know, develop products together and pass those up to that project team. So one of those subgroups was what we call the options and strategies group. It was Fed, states, NGOs, um, and a couple tribal representatives. And this group was together probably for about a year. And they went through the process of taking all of those options that were submitted by the public, all 150 of them, categorizing them, um, going through in brutal detail with the consultant how to estimate cost and timing and all of that criteria for each one of those. They assigned ratings to each one of those. That's where the A through E stuff happened. Um, I'm not going to pretend that there was always agreement in that work group, I mean, definitely there was a lot of agreeing to disagree type stuff that was going on, you know, in terms of, um, you know, so-and-so stakeholder, you think this should get an A for permitting when really we think it should get a, you know, a D for permitting. So we'd have to just pick something in the middle and then document that there was an agreement on that, but we just had to move forward. Um, then we came to using that same group to build the portfolios 
because you know they had been together for almost a good year and just developed some rapport and some trust um, and understood what went behind all of the rating for all of those options. They were much more well poised to put together those portfolios. We built a tool for them to do so. You know, the key is you have to have when you have different diverging stakeholder views, you have to have more than one outcome <laughs> available. So that's why there's four portfolios. Um, you could probably tell which one the conservation community really worked on and which one the state really worked on. Um, another key was that we weren't going to recommend any one portfolio. It was just demonstrating that there's a diff bunch of different ways to deal with the problem. There's trade-offs, but we're not saying which one is better than the other. And then probably the other thing that um, got us through it was not naming the portfolios. It's as silly as it sounds. Um, we spent so much time trying to come up with names for those portfolios that all the groups could agree on, and it just was getting us nowhere. And we went back to A, B, C, and D. You kind of lose the identification and you know who it's affiliated with that way. And I think people could talk about it a little more easier without it being assigned to them um, through that approach. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much. I um, We are unfortunately out of time. I certainly have a lot more questions from you. You might be hearing from me soon. Yeah, no um, problem. On behalf of the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative, I want to thank you for this presentation today. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who made the time to participate. We will be making this available um, for the rest of the team some folks who couldn't be on the call today and uh, consider it very valuable information. So thank you, Carly, and um, thanks to everyone. Thanks, Amy. Okay, take care, all.